could go ahead and take us away again we welcome you hey. to this episode Welcome, everybody. The, for those that attended a couple of weeks ago, welcome back. And for those that are new, hello, hello, hello. Um, I'm Dr. Mark Creer. I'm, I'm blessed to be a two-time Olympian and, you know, licensed and uh, clinical psychologist. But more importantly, I am an advocate of mental health and when it comes to sports and the challenges that we go through. Um, if Can everybody see the screen that we're sharing? Okay. You can do a thumbs up. I, I won't be able to uh, see you, but LaShawn will be able to take your comments in the chat and we can sprinkle them in here. Uh, this wasn't intended to be long. Last time we only wanted it to be about, what, 20 minutes or so and it wind up being an hour and a half. So if we go over uh, today, uh, that's okay. Um, we can save the questions for last and we can interject. But the first thing I wanted to do was just uh, go over some of this. Um, this is a, dis a disclaimer. Um, this is um, the Zoom webinar, such as the text, graphics, images, and other materials contained within this presentation um, are for informational purposes only. Um, you're not my client, and those that are minors need um, approval and um, disclaimers and, and, and whatnot. So this is not a treatment plan, so please don't take it as we are getting a one-to-one -one therapy or counseling. This is all informational. And if you want to become a client, that's fine, but um, please don't substitute this for any one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions that is designed for counseling or mental health. Uh, this is for informational purposes. So AAU and our, you know, my uh, business is not um, liable for any, you know, we're not here giving you a professional diagnosis. Okay. I just want to get that. We are going to give you information and some coping skills to deal with some of the things that athletes are going through, but please do not use this as substitute. I want to be very clear on that. Um, if you want, there's psychologists and psychiatrists online. If you want to retain our services, that's fine, but that's a whole nother incident, especially if you're dealing with children that are 18 and under then they need parental consent in order to even have a conversation regarding mental health or a session, if you will. All right, any uh, questions about that? So let's get down to the nitty gritty. I just wanted to reiterate, as we're looking in the news and everything, we hear the uh, importance of mental health and we hear this term and we hear how some athletes are uh, even taking their lives, are stressed out and we are not immune to such um, conditions, nor are our athletes that we coach. So I just wanted to um, discuss uh, some tactics and 411 to get you get your minds going, if you will. Okay. So the first one is some of the statistics. If you can look at the screen, this is the reality that we're dealing with, uh, whether it's uh, youth to uh, middle school to high school, even to professional. And these are some um, terminologies that you hear, but this is how it relates to uh, youth sports. Um, ADHD, which is atten attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or you hear ADD as well, occurs in an estimated three to 5% of school-aged children. Okay, that's school-aged children. So if you guys are coaching or, or parents of school-aged children, which I'm sure we are in some aspect, whether it's in coaching, counseling, parenting, or just mentoring, three to 5% are dealing with the ADHD, okay? And if you guys wanna know what ADHD is, it's a medical condition. You know, a person that has different differences in brain development, if you will, and brain activity that affects attention and the ability to stay still and self-control. That's just a general you know, definition of ADHD. Uh, many of you may have athletes that are, uh, are dealing with that three to 5%. I'm sure that you uh, know or know someone who does. And the next one is approximately one in 200 children are diagnosed with Tourette syndrome. We had a question regarding that as well. And boys are roughly four times more likely than girls. And it's also a condition of the nervous system, Tourette. You know, a TS, as we call it, causes people to have tics. And there are sudden twitches, movements, 
um, are sound that people do repeatedly. Some of you athletes may be uh, going through that. Again, we could treat that, but not in this webinar and, and not to give you um, counseling on dealing with that, but these are things that some of your athletes are going through. Some of you may be going through if you're viewing as an athlete. Approximately 11% of the ages 13 to 18 years old are affected by a depressive disorder. Uh, this is very uh, striking. Look at that, 13 to 18 years old, 11%. More than 10 million Americans have bipolar. And you know, sometimes we throw these terms around where you had ADD or ADHD or you got bipolar, but it's really important to know what these mental illnesses or these conditions are because you don't wanna misdiagnose or assume that you know because you will not give him or her the right treatment if you just throw these um, terms out loosely. You know. Um, so we understand this, uh, more than 10 Americans, 10 million Americans have bipolar. Approximately one in 68 children have autism, spectrum disorder, you know, um, ASD as we call it, um, refers to, a, it's like a broad range of conditions characterized by challenges with social skills, repetitive behavior, speech, and nonverbal communication. Again, this is just a brief definition of what these terms mean. So when you're dealing with it, you can have some sense of awareness of what these terms mean. Most children are diagnosed with Asperger's between the age of five and nine. Um, I find in my practice that that's becoming more professional, but that's uh, um, is a form of autism, um, you know, spectrum uh, disorder, ASD. Um, it, this is something that I, I won't even go into, but it's, 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 it's important that we understand that that's a growing uh, condition within athletes is Asperger's. Appro approximately 20% of Americans will suffer from panic attacks at some point in their lives. Stress, anxiety, panic attack. And there's a difference between having an anxiety and a panic attack. Some of our athletes are maybe having a little bit of anxiety, but a panic attack is totally different. And we'll touch what the difference is later, but just know that there's a difference so you won't be so are you panicking or might be having anxiety or you know having anxiety and you're thinking someone's having a panic attack. So we need to be clear on that. Just look at some of more of these statistics, you know, for time's sake, I'm not going to read every single one, but social anxiety disorder occurs before the age of 10, about 35% of the time. These are youth sports social anxiety disorder. How do you expect your athletes or yourself to perform if you're dealing with anxiety and stress? And how do you have some coping skills? You know, um, about seven to eight percent of people will have PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder uh, at some point in their lives. And depending on what culture, what ethnicity, there's different times, uh, different types of uh, traumatic disorders. There's uh, complex uh, trauma. There's different types of trauma. There's a uh, inner city trauma. There's, um, uh, there's a array, even run on with what's going on in different parts of the company, uh, country. So that affects the family and the family affects athletes. So to be aware of the different type of PTSDs living in different cultures and different environments can, you know, um, um, can result in different types of trauma that's not as easily diagnosed or treated as PTSD, all right? So we talk about mental health and I just want to ask real quick, you know, if you guys know, what is this thing called mental health? Everybody's talking about this mental health and, and we see a lot of commercials and, and it can become diluted and <laughs> confusing. You know, we say, I think I'm okay. But then we say, well, one out of every four person is considered a mental DSM type of, <laughs> well, that's confusing, right? So mental health, and I said this before, is a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with normal stress of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. So we say, what, what does that mean, right? What is, so this is a general definition, and you guys kind of fill it in the blank. But mental health is, you know, a state of well-being. Now, what does well-being mean? You know, we all have stress, we all have anxiety, anxiety. we all have forms of levels of um, depression and sometimes sadness, but mental health is when you're able to uh, cope with and have coping mechanisms that will not inhibit you from performing daily functions without 
you know, having panic attacks or stress attacks or, you know, conditions that will hinder your ability to function normally and healthily on a daily basis. So mental health is just like a physical health. You have, um, you know, obesity, which is not physically healthy. And then you have mental disorders and me mental illnesses that are not physically healthy, but you can still function. You know, you might not be in the best of shape, but you can still function. And there's some things that you can still function, you know, uh, psychologically, but it's imperative that you know the difference. So that's what mental health is. Now, I want to be clear on some things between coaching, counseling, and consulting, and mentoring, and if you will. A lot of coaches here, and, 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 and there's a difference between coaching and counseling. You can look at the slide, and like I said, this is just a general definition. There's a word called pathology that really deals with your past, and that's, in a nutshell, for time's sake, is what really counseling is. Counseling is more seeking healing, you know, um, you know, um, involving more digging into your past, where coaching is more goal-oriented, whether it's smart goals, more futuristic, okay? Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? How can we get there? Um, coach counseling is more what causing you not to get there and coaching you don't need licensing training is if you will as much as you need counseling counseling you need to be certified through your state and your your, 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 your country and in your city uh, there's years of you know <laughs> schooling coaching you can just be an athlete and then learn behind your coach and assisted coach and going on and so on. There's a difference between regular coaching, you got executive coaching, you got performance coaching, you have all type of coaching. But for this presentation, if this, this webinar, I guess we're just gonna deal with, you know, athletic coaching. So understand that coaching, you got life coaching, relationship coaching, but there's a difference between counseling and psychotherapy, if you will, and coaching. One is dealing with your past, your pathology, and one is dealing with your future. We're gonna deal with where we are and how can we get our athletes or how can we get ourselves to accomplish the goals and uh, you know some action steps that we want to accomplish, whether it's this season, uh, this year, and whatnot. So let's make sure that. So if you're a coach, you should not, <laughs> unless you are trained, you should not be trying to counsel. And counsel is also diagnosing and giving your opinion as far as what you think their problems are or whatnot. So that's counseling, but coaching is more so um, fulfilling one's goals, a team goal, if you will, or an individual goal. Make sure you understand that so you won't be um, accused or, <laughs> you know, um, you just won't be uh, trying to counsel when you should be coaching and vice versa. And on that note, there's a difference between coaching and consoling and counseling and consoling. And sometimes, you know, you got to understand what these different terms mean. Consoling is just hearing, listening, and that's okay. But once you start giving, well, I think you're suffering from depression and that's thing, you know, they're saying that they're depressed. If you're not licensed or trained, then that's out of order and they're responsible for you. So just make sure you know the difference between counseling, coaching, and consoling. So now we're talking about youth sports and we're going to be dealing with this. And if you guys have any questions, jot them down and we'll be sure to fire through this. I just want to tell you guys so you guys can get an understanding. Um, youth sports coaching. Now, this is what we're not talking about life coaching or performance coaching, which I do. But we're talking about youth coaching with AAU or USATF or any AYSO, any youth group or uh, advanced group, if you will. What is youth coaching? To provide an enjoyable and safe sporting experience for an assigned group of youngsters while they learn individual and team game skills, sports pursuit, and fair play. Now, do we see that? Do we practice that every day? I was at a track meet last week and my daughter ran. I have a daughter and she ran. And, you know, they should have uh, youth ethics and etiquettes when it comes to the parents. We had this one person, they had a radio blasted and they were yelling and using obscenities, go, 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 you know, cursing at it, destroy them, destroy them. But they weren't really saying destroy it, you know what I mean? It was really embarrassing. And then, you know, it, it showed no resemblance of what youth coaching is. And you had the coaches and I seen one athlete crying because I guess they had to run the 100 meters, 400 meters, 800 meters, and 1500 meters, back to back to back. That was the order. And they had no race. And I was working the check-in and they were crying and, you know, we were like, well, why are you running? You just ran the 400. Well, my coach forced me to run. 
and then and then the fifteen hundred. Then my coach is forcing me to run, understanding about discipline, but this that type of you know coaching was not uh, um, in unison with what youth sports coaching is all about, and this adds to the stress and anxiety and the depression. Uh, that our athletes are going through. So but we'll talk about that a little later. But this is what the definition of coaching is. Now, what are some of the hurdles that we, you know, we face, uh, you know, as being athletes? You know, this is real. We, 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 you know, this is what we deal with. The thrill of victory or the agony of defeat. You know, uh, you see these pictures. Someone's over there successful hugging. They won. And then someone's devastated because they lost or they didn't perform up to his or her capabilities. This is what we deal with. This is what is different uh, in the mainstream of life than sports, other than maybe you know, marketing or whatnot. But sports is you have immediate, you win or lose, and you succeed in your mind or fail. And that's a hard thing to deal with when you're a youth or when you're growing up or even when you're a coach. So the, the, the thrill of victory and the agony. Now, some of the things that we are dealing with. I want you guys to look at this and really understand the importance of understanding, you know, coping skills and mental health and and how it affects your athletes and how it affects you. Because you can be the greatest dentist or the greatest surgeon in the world, but you cannot operate on yourself. And sometimes coaches need coaching and coaches need mental health and counseling, not because there's something wrong, but there's something called compassion fatigue, for example, which people in caring industries, nurses, coaches, experience and, and you get burnt out or actually you get compassion fatigue, which is different than burnout. But just for the sake of this conversation, you guess you guys may think it's like a form of burnout, but you get fatigued and then you're not unable to do your you're unable to do your job as successfully as a coach. Stress, anxiety, depression, and feel look at this. Youth age from five to 17 years old, this is astonishing. 60%, and I'll give you guys the references and the stats and the, and the resources and the references went at the end of the slides, but 50, 60% coming from others. Others can, can, can think of parents, coaches, you know, and, 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 and you know, peer pressure, whatnot. 60% of stress, anxiety, depression, and fear are coming from others. 40% of that is coming from self-imposed or coming from self. Now, there's a shift when they go from 18 to prof professional level. I have clients that are in you know, NFL and Major League Baseball, and they feel so much stress and pressure. But look at the switch. It switches from 60% is self-imposed to 40% coming from others, society, coaches. Why do you think that? Why do we think that, gosh, from five years old when they're starting their sports to 17 is coming from others? Because the expectations haven't been developed yet. As you get older, when you get 18, you have expectations. If you're a successful youth or a successful high school or a successful college, and then each level is higher and a different challenge and expectations grow. And you start giving these expectations. Well, I was undefeated in elementary school. I was undefeated in youth. But, you know, when you go to college, everybody is a state champion on a scholarship. Everybody. Then when you get to a, a professional level, everybody's all American. So those self-imposed uh, expectations create the stress, anxiety, and depression. That's why there's a shift. And coming from others is 40%, which is agents and, and society. And, you know, and then when you're used to having a certain, you know, victory, uh, it, it can become very depressing. And you put that self-imposed depression, as you can see with the symbol right there of somebody being carried the chain and ball, you know, your, your biggest uh, problem and the biggest um, challenge is yourself at this level. But youth is what's more importantly is the pressure coming from parents. You know, they spend all this money on private training because they want their child to be exceptional. And they're driving them two hours for them to play for this particular team or have this particular athlete, I mean, this particular coach or join this particular team. And, and I, if you guys can see the pressure that that must be putting on uh, youth and remember children are wet cement and they're going to get harder as time grows but they're very impressionable and moldable and if you you know put those you know expectations and, and pressure and you know the uh, subliminal praise when they win and, and and ignoring if they lose 
it's going to become depressing. It's going to become stressful and anxiety and, 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 and un unhappy. And that's why if you look at the statistics, most youth superstars do not go on to be, you know, um, world class and professionals because they burn out because it's no longer fun or they overtrain. And that's because of the, from five to 17 year old, the um, expectations and the stress is coming from the parents and coaches. Yes, we want our athletes to win, but we have to define what winning is and we have to also prepare them not to win in a particular event, but they can still win in life. They can still be a champion just because they don't come in first. Now, I know that's cliche-ish, but it's the truth. Everybody's not going to win. There's only one number one and there's thousands of athletes. So what do you do with those other athletes that don't? We don't want to you know, disregard them. So it's important at this age that we understand that subconsciously our pressure, subconsciously the children are going through the pressure, stress, and anxiety is coming from the coaches and their parents. And then as you get older, it shifts. There's a, a you know, expectation shift, as you can see. All right. So below are some stressors athletes may face that could you know be accompanied by a variety of coping behaviors. Now, I just want you to look at this real quick and these are some of the things that, you know, as coaches, your athletes are going through and some you may be going through yourself or if you're an athlete, some things that you're going through. They're a little no brainers, but it's good to see them and to identify, them. you know, transition, joining a new team, competitive level. You know, my daughter is uh, she was 11 and 12 and now she's 13 and 14. And, you know, when she was a 12 year old running with 11 and 12, she was maybe, you know, more comfortable in the top three or the top five. But now when you go to 13 and 14, it's that transition. So now she's on the bottom of that trying to work, work her way up. So, you know, do new competition level, adjusted to a new high school, new team, new athletes, you know, for that, you know, purpose, new coaches. This is things that can, are stressors that are subliminal, but if you don't pay attention to, that can hinder the growth and the success of our athletes. Experiencing injury or burnout. We talked about the burnout because previously the pressure those statistics are contributing to the burnout, uh, experiencing injuries. Most youth athletes, you know, five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years old, they don't really experience, you know, maybe a couple of shin splints, but major hamstring pulls. You know, that's, you know, maybe in your high school, if you're lucky and then, you know, you have an experience, but really experiencing injuries are burnout because of the overtraining and those expectations are not being uh, met. It's not fun anymore. So that is something that is contributing to why our athletes are not performing as they should or as we know they could. And on practice, they're doing great. But on meet day, you know, but at the same time, as coaches, on coaches, on practice, we're doing great. But on meet day, we have our stressors, too. So maybe we're not we're underperforming on meet days as well, whether it's yelling, whether it's having, you know, expectations or like that one coach having your athlete one on one, four, eight and 16 because they missed practice. And that's your way of disciplining them, you know? So again, this is not just solely for the um, athletes. This is for the coaches as well. Teammate relationship issues. Come on, bullying. Uh, we have a lot of new things that are going on with this generation, you know, with the social media, with the uh, gender identity, with the racial uh, uh, crisis that's going on and, and, and all the things that our, our youth are dealing with relationship issues are so important, whether it's bullying, whether it's pecking order. I know in track and field, who's going to be on a relay? Let's say you got five people in the whole drama with our, the favoritism of the coaches or the, the thought of being, you know, the coach being favoritism by one athlete. It's just a relationship, teammate relationship issues are, are so dynamic in youth sports and all sports for that matter. We haven't had it at the Olympic level dealing with the, the relay teams, you know? So performance issues, again, how am I performing? You know, it's, it's, it's when you cross that finish line or at the end of the game and you look at your stats, if you don't have a positive management or a positive coach, and if you, you know, strike out or go 0 for 5 or run, you know, two seconds, you know, uh, you know, behind your PR, you know, those performance issues can leave stress, anxiety, and depression, and ultimately quitting or doing other, you know, um, elements to maintain, and that's, that's not healthy. The perceived pressure, expectations communicated by others, and this is, you know, the, the people in the stands, the parents, the coaches, 
um, those microaggressions, if you will, when it comes to sports, the, you know, what time did you run? Uh, what'd you run? You know, one of the worst things you can do is ask an athlete, you know, let them tell you, but what, what time did you run? You know, oh, did you have a good time? Or, you know, did you, you know, you ran a good, how was it? Did you have a good time? Let them tell you, oh, I did okay. Or I didn't run as much. Oh, next time. But when you ask, what time did you run? Well, what did everybody else run? What place you get? Those are pressures. We're talking about children and their minds are developing. Even at a professional level, you don't want to hear that when you didn't have a good, good performance. So the perceived pressure, the expectations communicated by others, the media in some cases are your parents and your, your teammates and coaches are the media when it comes to the youth. Life stressors outside of sports and performance, schoolwork, family, social life, different demographics, different upbringings, different. Remember, life is more than sport. So there might be children involved with, you know, um, dysfunctional families, abusive childhoods, uh, broken homes where they're dealing with visitation issues. As a coach, you need to be sympathetic and understanding to these because if not, you know, if they miss a practice, you know, uh, then you give them one, four, eight, and a 1500 meter to run. Well, mommy didn't drop me off at daddy's house or daddy didn't drop off at mama's house and I left my spikes at mom's house when they're along with dad. It's a confusing and challenging world out there. And I think we need to be cognizant or aware of this when we are, you know, distributing our discipline and our corrective, you know, teachings to understand there's life stressors and there's also stressors that we have ourselves. So make sure before we go to practice or before we address the team, we address ourselves. And again, it's not just all on the athlete, where coaches are supposed to mentor and, and support these kids, whether they're professional or not, they have enough stress on their plates. So these are some, some other things. So coping skills and strategies. Main reason I wanted to do this was to deal with the coping skills and strategies. This is life. This is what we're dealing with. You know, we're dealing with indoor season, going to outdoor. We're dealing with year-round sports. Everybody wants to do well. What are some coping skills and strategies? Well, first, we always talk about what is coping skills? What is, what do we mean by coping skills? Again, I want you guys to give a, just a brief understanding. So when you're talking, you understand the difference between coping skills or coping or stress, anxiety. You can understand what these terms mean. So you can um, be, be as informative as you can. As a human being, it is expected and considered natural to experience stress and engage in mental or behavior coping efforts. We all have coping skills. Um, the easiest one I can say is your eyelids. You know, there's a book called Listen to Your Blink. If something is going to hit you in the eye or you perceive it, you're going to close your eyes, you're going to blink. And basically, that's what coping skills is. You can read this. Um, but basically, that's what it is. Listen to your blink, a, a, a natural way of coping, whether it's healthy or unhealthy, is the, to be discussed. What is coping strategies? It's a strategy usually involved in a conscious is more direct approach to problems. So this is where we have every coach, um, coping and issues are inevitable, but strategies is a choice. And how do you have a strategy? And this is where, as a coach, and as an athlete, you guys can come together and create a coping strategy. Some athletes, and we'll talk about this later, listen to music, or some athletes do visualization and all that, but you have to have a coping strategy to deal with the pressures of the sport that you're competing in and then what's going on in life. And on a footnote, sometimes your team and your sport is your coping strategy. You're coming from maybe an abusive home and, 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 and your family is your team. And it's very important that the coaches dictate that pace or dictate that sensitivity. So, you know, you don't want to go from one abusive environment to another. That's where the complex and that's what complex trauma comes from is that continual repetitive trauma and abuse. And you grow up thinking that that's, you know, a normal uh, way of living, which is not. So this is what coping strategy is, coping skills. Now, here are some coping skills, and I think this will be on videos available, so you don't have to take notes or because I'm going to be going fast from here on out. But coping skills, acknowledging, acknowledging that there is an issue, um, whether I'm nervous, whether I'm scared, whether I feel like I'm not prepared, speaking from an athlete, you know, um, are, you know, acknowledging, hey, this is a tough competition that we're going to be running against, but I think, but I know that you're ready. 
you know, control the controllable. This is what I always say, you know, you got to dig into your athlete's mind that you got to control the controllable and the controllable is if yourself, even as a coach, you can't control what lane you're in. A lot of athletes are what heat you're in or what, you know, position you're going to play or, you know, you can't control all of that, but you can control your reaction to it. You know, um, as adults and coaches, there's something called emotional intelligence, which you guys, if you don't know, really look in, it's just your maturity level. You can't, you know, meet anxiety with anxiety. That's going to be a, a recipe for disaster. Um, control the uncontrollable and be able to identify with your athletes or even with yourself. What are the controllables? You're establishing goal setting, you know, one step at a time. Um, let's get to, you know, I know we want to make it to the Olympics, but let's get through this one meet and let's get through the Olympic trials first, because in order to make it to the Olympics, you need to, you know, make the Olympic trials. So let's take one step at a time and, and, and approach it uh, accordingly. You know, uh, of course, we've got the new developing skills and sharpening your skills. There's a difference between what you're good at and what you need to work on. And a lot of coaches subconsciously, because we live in such a critical world, we always focus on what needs to be improved and not balancing out what, what your skill set is already good. If you have if you're excellent start and you need to work on your finish, excuse me, let's give praise and acknowledgement for that person having an excellent start and let's work on that. And then we can trickle in what you know what you need to work on you know separate fear from safety and this is you know important as well some kids and students and athletes they, they're fearful you know fear of losing the fear of winning the fear of disappointment from safety and sometimes if you're not careful you'll you'll be enabling you know fear instead of encouraging courage if you will so just understand that these are some of the coping skills that are necessary um, here are some things to keep in mind when supporting young adults with mental illness. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to breeze through this because we're going to open this up for Q&A, but build a support network for yourself. As you're, if you're an athlete or a coach, build a support network for yourself. Sometimes that network might not be people that are on your team. Hopefully it is. Hopefully the coaches, it might not be your parents, but hopefully it is, but find a supporting network for yourself. Someone that in a group that accepts you for who you are and have the same goals in mind. Um, when you're around a certain community, when I was training for the Olympics and, you know, one of my bad habits, I love chocolate chip cookies with pecans or pecans, whatever y'all call them. I call them pecans. Oh my goodness. Double tree hotel cookies. I can't stay there anymore. My wife don't want me to stay there. I tell you what, but during my training, I could not be around those that ate them. They were like, hey, Mark, let's go here. Let's go to, you know, In-N-Out Burger. You know, you're training hard. But I had to build a support network for myself that believed in it and that supported what I was trying to do. Because if I were to hang around the same type of people that, you know, were, were not a good influence, then I would have probably be, um, wouldn't be sitting here as a two-time Olympian, I'll tell you that. So build a support network for yourself. Remember that this is you know, happening to you too. So as a coach, build a support system. And as an athlete, build a support system. Don't ignore the warning signs. You know, um, there's no, nothing tough about acting tough. And sometimes when we talk about mental illness, we think that well, that means crazy, but we just told you what it is. We're not crazy. We're not, oh my gosh, you need to go talk to a shrink. No, you know, um, when you pull a muscle, you go to a physical therapist. And when you have something wrong, you go to a doctor in the same sense. So it, getting rid of the, the the stigma of, you know, oh, there's something wrong with me, suck it up. No, there is something might be mentally, might be having a serotonin imbalance. There might be some mental illnesses that, you know, you just need a little work through. But the longer you wait, the more, it becomes that concrete women uh, remember children are wet cement so the longer you wait the longer that cement hardens and you know something that might have been diagnosed with some um, you know cognitive behavioral therapy or some other forms could be resolved in a privacy but rather you wait and ignore the signs just like an injury what do we say to our athletes tell the coach if something is hurting we'll let you know and concussions we'll let you know if you should run or if you should go back on a field of play. So please do not ignore the warning signs that we have mentioned and that we're going to talk about, you know, moving forward. Take a break. 
Uh, sometimes the best workout is not a workout. I tell my athletes that as well. Sometimes even as a coach, take a break. You, you get in too deep. You, you can't see straight. You, you know, you become obsessed. Um, I'd rather spend one extra day recovering and resting than one month of recovering. So take a break and understand when it's time to, you know, you know, um, take a, you know, take a, take a little break and clear your mind. Get counseling. This is so important now. Coming from a therapist, this is important, but even as a counselor, even as a coach, you can determine which one you need. But, you know, if, if you see that there's issues that are going on that are lasting more than an episode or more than a month or two, seek counseling, you know, um, seek some help. You spend lots of money for your athletes or for yourself to have the best equipment, whatever your budget can afford. You spend lots of money on private training if you can afford it. And if not, you do the best you can. But do that same with your mental health. Invest in your mental health. Invest in just making sure. And I'm going to put a list at the end of this presentation. There are pro bonos, and pro bono is for free. So you can get quality counseling and therapy in your communities because by law, you're, you're required to donate for free your time. So don't let financial um, limitations and stop you from getting help. There are resources that you can have that you can speak to a counselor or a professional coach or a counselor or a therapist, and they can help you um, with whatever you're going through. You just have to, you know, but I'll provide some links at the end of that, but please, uh, you don't have to spend $200 an hour. Um, there are some pro bono services out there for you or your athletes. Develop a strategy for handling unusual behavior. You know, um, Look at listen to what this says. Understand your limitations for dealing with mental illness. As a coach, you can offer love and support, but you cannot fix the problem. Remember that. Put your egos in check. OK, we, we deal with this a lot when it comes to coaches, whether I could coach everything from long jump to the hurdles. Well, their specialties, just like in, in, in disciplines, their specialty in mental health and the difference between coaching and counseling, which we talked about before. So make sure you know your limitation because you can't fix the problem and sometimes you are the problem so make sure that you develop a strategy for handling on your behavior what does that mean have a resource group have a reference have a list of um, professional counselors or lay counselors or some trained professional whatever level that can handle mental health issues don't think that you can look at youtube and look at you know uh, something on youtube or read a paragraph in a magazine article and think that you're capable of treating something that may require more training and more you know resources so just have your resources available um just like you do with your sport just have it in mental health just in case uh you you, you yourself or one of your athletes are you know having unusual behavior and this is something that's dear to me because we're losing too many of our athletes after the fact and it's hard even trained professionals it's hard to detect those signs. What are the warning signs? And then after the after the fact, you say, oh, I should have and I could have. Uh, well, let's be preventive. Let's have some handling strategies. Let's just err on the side of caution. Let's have some resources, a couple of counselors. Sports psychologists are good, but more therapists, if you will, that deals with you know normal life issues also because half the issues are not sports related. They're, you know, home related, if you will, your, your pathology, your history related. So let's just make sure we have those resources so we can um, have the best arsenal available. All right. So we talk about this thing and we call mental toughness. Uh, and, and I'm going through this because we're going to have some questions, but I just want to make sure I get this through. And but we always talk about this mental toughness in the beginning. We had a definition of mental toughness and we talked about you know, mental toughness is having the natural or developed psychological edge that enables you to what generally cope better than your opponents. Be mentally tough. But the stereotype does that mean is well, if you have a broken leg or a you know, you know, an injury, be mental tough, suck it up. You know, I remember I ran at the Olympics with a broken arm. I was blessed to win a silver medal, but that wasn't a mental toughness, that was physically hurt. And then I Ran in a 2000 Olympics with a double hernia. Go figure, right? And that hurt. So you can have all the mental toughness if you will, but having um, an injury is having an injury. 
But mental toughness is being able to determine the difference between injury and hurt, fear and anxiety versus butterflies in your stomach and being able to cope with the, 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 the pressure and the stress of, of competing, you know, specifically be more consistent and better than your opponent and remaining determined, focused, confident, and in control under pressure. Well, that's kind of a, a hard thing to do if you're going through some mental challenges or some mental illnesses or just, let's just say mental hurdles. And as a coach, if you push your child to do something what they're not ready to do, then that's not for their, that's not teaching of character that's um, going to burn them out. So let's make sure we understand what mental toughness is once we have mental health in its proper, you know, diagnosed place. You know, once we're mentally healthy and we can maybe work on our mental toughness now, but one comes first. And these are some of the characteristics of mental toughness that we're trying to get our athletes to say and we get motivational speeches and I travel around giving motivational speeches and we talk about, hey, have an unshakable belief, you know, um, you, you know, or regulate performance, you know, and, and be aware of or in control their thoughts and feeling controlled the environment are not affected by things outside, stay in the zone. I have this program I call it in the zone. This is once again, characteristic of mental toughness. But in order to get to this point, we have to be mentally healthy in order to implement mental toughness. So you can't, you know, put the heart, uh, the cart, cart, cart before the horse and make sure you're not trying to get your athlete, you know, well, again, mentally tough, but we need to get them mentally healthy before we can get them mentally tough so they can adjust so they won't burn out. And I see a lot of coaches do that. He just needs toughness. He just doesn't have that iron of the tiger. Well, maybe there's some stress, anxiety, and depression that we discussed earlier with this bipolar, Tourette, ADHD, Asperger. Maybe there's some conditions that is causing the mental toughness, if you will, to be delayed. And you can be doing more harm than helpful if you throw them in a, a race and say, be mental tough. You know, that could um, cause them to burn out like we talked about in those statistics. Athletes rely more on what a blight. And now this is important because athletes rely on more than just mental toughness to cope with stress, anxiety, and depression. You know, there are three, and I'm not going to get into this because this is more advanced, but there's three universal ways elite athletes or athletes, you know, traditional sports and esports, if you will, cope with stress, anxiety, and depression. There's the EFC, which is the emotional focus. And there's really two that they do, which is the EFC and the PFC. But emotionally focused coping, you know, you guys can look this up and, you know, there, there's ways that you can trickle this down to your youth. But if you're, you know, in high school or above, you know, they get your emotionally focused coping. You have your problem focused coping, you know, actively troubleshooting and problem solving to contract stressful, you know, and specific contact. You got your avoidance coping using avoidance strategies, disengaged physical or psychological, you know, block out sources, you know, get in the zone, block it out, or you can have your emotionally focused using, you know, um, other mindful techniques, you know, uh, to combat fight or flight, you know, visualization. These are all things that you can do. I want you guys to look at them because they're, but these are the three main coping mechanisms that you can use. Mostly the emotional focus coping is what youth use. And that is, you know, using emotional regulation and other mindful techniques to calm. Take a deep breath, you know, um, visualize, block everything out. This is what we say. But if you um, take some time to do some research on the EFC, then you will see that those are, you know, EFC and the PFC are mainly used and, and, and are beneficial for helping you cope with the stress and anxiety. And I just got a couple of more and then we'll get to the Q&A. Okay, this is just a summary, guys, of what we talked about, and then we'll open this up, you know, for, you know, Q&A. Um, for the athletes, remember that it's okay and normal to feel bad sometimes. This is something that society does not allow us to, but now we're recognizing what mental health is. Now, remember, mental health is not that you're, there's no scale of one to 10, but if you're unable to perform and do, you know, function abilities, without hindering yourself, harming yourself, or delaying yourself, that's mental health. But mental illness is anything other than, so let's say it's depression, you're staying in bed too long, or you're quitting your sport, or you're becoming antisocial, that's where the mental illness comes in, or you're becoming domestic, aggressive, or violent emotionally and physically. These are mental illnesses 
And you know, whether it's hypothyroid or bipolar, just something that is a chemical imbalance or a psychological disorder or a, a you know, these are things that are what we say mental health. So it's like, you know, an injury. You can walk, you might have a limp, okay, but if you're walking and you can't walk anymore, that's what we're saying when it, when it becomes detrimental to your normal productivity. So just remember that it's okay to feel bad sometimes and it's okay to feel sad sometimes. So don't throw out the label. You're depressed because, you know, you lost a race or you lost a loved one or something happened. I mean, it's okay and normal to feel bad sometimes, you know, it says practice noticing uncomfortable emotions when they arise and labeling them, being able to verbalize when you are, for example, angry are anxious. That's where the communication comes when it hopefully with your parents or hopefully with your coach or that safe zone that we talked about or that, uh, that team that you're trying to form. Sometimes you just want to say, I had a bad race. I didn't know what I did wrong. I thought I did everything right. So I had a bad performance. And sometimes you just need someone to listen and say, okay, and there's nothing wrong. Well, you need to be mentally tough. Or the reason why is you didn't execute. You don't need the criticism. You know, you're criticizing yourself enough. What you need is a safe haven to be able to communicate for athletes. So remember, it's okay, you know, and to reiterate that you feel angry or you feel bad, you know, and that shows that you care. Ask for help. Remember that you're never alone and hopefully you'll have a safe haven as an athlete. Or, or if you're looking at this presentation, I'll give you some references and people that you can call and organizations, but you should always ask for help. Do never feel like you're alone and have to answer when encountering different situations, you know, you're your best you know, resource. So make sure you let people know and make sure you can trust people because if you have a coach and you're a coach and don't come to me with that, I don't handle emotions well, then you're not, doing what a youth coach or a professional coach is supposed to do. So make sure that as an athlete, you know, you ask for help. And that doesn't mean say I'm crazy. And please don't use that word. You, you can just be going through stress. You can just be going through anxiety. And you just may need confirmation that it's okay to feel this way. I would feel that way too. So make sure that you, you ask for help when you're going through and don't wait too late. And I just reiterate this to coaches and parents, please make sure you are that help. Make sure that they feel trustworthy to come to you. Make sure you're you know, the, the solution and not the problem because we're losing too many people too soon, too early, not just by suicide, which is growing, especially in the minority community, which is being underrepresented in the, <laughs> in the mental health field, but another subject at another time, but it's just suicide, depression, anxiety, drugs, uh, quitting, you know, these are things that because they are turning to other resources because they are asking for help. And I just want us to make sure that we are aware and cognizant of what our athletes are going through. And but first, we got to make sure that we are mentally healthy enough to be able to help our athletes. So this goes to both the athletes and the coaches and the parents. You know, speaking of which, for the parents. You know, take time to debrief after an event, sports related or otherwise, put some time aside to chat about coping skills your child used or try to have them identify which ones work best and which ones are not effective. This is very important because you're learning a lot of characteristics from your home environment. So your guardian or parent, whomever you are, you know, spending that time with, take time to have a brief conversation and debrief with them not a criticized session. Well, I, what I saw is you didn't get out the blocks or you did this wrong or you weren't. No, let them tell you. Most coaches will understand that you don't coach by criticizing. They'll tell you what they feel. That's when you're an excellent coach, when you have a conversation as a coach, I wasn't following through with my technique or I didn't execute, you know, the last, and that's when you're doing effective coaching, when you're getting them to think and they're not thinking, you're not thinking for them and be creating that dependency. So take time to debrief if you're a parent. Problem solved together. Remember, sports is an opportunity, is something that you can have in common, something that you can grow a bond with your child or with those that are under your care. So take time to problem solve together. How did that feel? Did you, did you feel angry or did you feel this? I saw that too. Give them a sense of safety and security. Give them that safe haven. You know, if your child feels stuck, when, you know, when it comes to recognizing and choosing possible actions they could take in a situation. Spend time identifying and writing down a few solutions. This, remain, this, this means parents and coaches that you have to do your homework as well. 
You can't just throw your athlete out there and say, well, I did my job and then you do your job. No, our job is not just on a playing field, it's doing research, it's saying, how can I like these webinars? How can I be a better parent or better coach or a better athlete, if you will? And by listening and by having resources available and not trying to be Dr. Fix It, but just maybe sometimes the best remedy is just listening and not trying to have an answer for it. And for lastly, as coaches, we want to support and prompt our athletes to be mindful of players exhibiting emotions that may be unproductive or detrimental to their performance. And what do we mean by these people? I didn't do too good or slamming down their helmet or throwing their spikes, you know, over the fence when they have a bad performance or crossing the finish line and dropping their head with such, such disgust. You have to teach these athletes and we know that you're going to win and you're going to lose is how you win and how you lose. And what is a definition? If you come in last and you PR by two seconds, I wouldn't call that a, a, a loss. So, you know, as a coach, you guys have your goals, which we talked about before, always a strategy, but prop your athletes, be mindful of players, you know, exhibiting emotions that, you know, um, that aren't productive to the overall goal, you know, provide praise. Praise athletes off after attempts to manage negative emotions or stressful situations. Remember, it's not just wins and losses. This is, you know, sports is to help prepare you for life unless you're going into a professional sports. And we know that, you know, percentage of that. So make sure these are all not just teachable moments for them, but teachable moments for yourself. Redefine, you know, why am I doing this? I don't want to compete with this other club. Am I trying to compete with this other team? You know, am I uh, doing this for selfish reasons? You know, you got to look at each athlete individually because just like, you know, you don't want to be judged and they don't want to be judged. Remember, these are athletes that have enough stress on their plates. Now we can open this up, LaShawn, to this that I want to get through this. These are some references. These are some apps that you can use as a coach and as an, and as an athlete, as a parent, the safe place. Um, you know, Liberate Mind Shift is very good. Um, happy Fi, uh, Breathe to Relax. These are some stress management tools to degree, de decrease the flight or flight stress responses. On a website, you have the, you know, the uh, U.S. Center for Mental Health and Sports. They have different age groups, you know, the National Center for School Mental Health and the National Alliance of Mental Health Illness, National Child Traumatic Stress Network. These are all references that you guys should have ready. So when your athletes may be displaying that are asking for help, you can have some solution even for yourself to just go back and refresh so you can understand what I can do to better myself as a coach and as an athlete. And lastly, but least, I'm gonna turn it over to our, my, the moderator, but these are two products. This is Lashan G, she's a speaker. She's the, uh, she's the moderator for this and she has a couple of books out and she deals with, um, I'll let her tell you what she deals with, but this is her contact information. Uh, my contact information is at the below. This is one book that I use with athletes is how to get over obstacles in the seed. It's called in the zone, how to, you know, find get stay in the zone and have a focus. And what we talked about in this brief presentation is elaborated on in the book and on, you know, private sessions. So if you're in either the male or female or both, please contact us for more information or to get this um, presentation and we'll be happy to, you know, uh, help you accordingly. So now I defer it back to uh, the moderator. I'm going to stop the screen share. And if there's any questions, let's, let's dig in and go for it. Thank you so much, Dr. Creer, for an amazing presentation tonight. Um, let's look at our chat really quickly. And it's... We have one question so far. Um, John Neighbor asks, um, what are the options if your athlete does not want to want or get needed counseling? Okay, where's my camera? Can you, am I on video? Uh, <laughs> no, you, I, just, you just turned your uh, screen uh, off. You just turned your video off. Oh, that's it. What, yeah. what are options? What are the options if your athlete doesn't want or get the needed counseling? Well, see, this is where knowing what, whether you feel that they need counseling or not comes in effect. And this is where co good coaching comes in effect. If you are seeing your athlete that is displaying 
uh, de- you know, harmful habits or habits that require mental health, then you should have resources and talk hopefully to their parents or whoever their guardian is to educate them. Hey, your, your, your child is, you know, showing some symptoms that I think that they need counseling with and then have that reference there. You, you know, you, you know, you can't make the mandatory. That's the thing about mental health, even unless they're doing bodily harm or acknowledging that you can do, you know, 5150 or whatever. But other than that, you have to educate, hopefully their, their parents and be educated as a coach and, you know, and then maybe bring, you know, what we even sometimes do on the older kids, we bring webinars and seminars and they talk about some of the things that athletes are going through so that athlete would hear it without feeling the pressure of you know thinking that you know you're singling me out so if you can't talk to their parents and maybe have someone come in or you do a a practice just talk about mental health has nothing to do with that particular athlete but it will cover what you feel that athlete might be experiencing i'd also say um definitely i agree with dr creer um that discernment is definitely necessary. I would also um, add that, you know, I think youth respond well <laughs> to subliminal messaging. Um, it's, it's kind of that messaging if, if you're familiar with, you know, mom and dad saying, you know, one thing and it goes in one ear and out the other, but then cousin such and such, uncle such and such, aunt such and such comes in and says the exact same thing. And all of a sudden this light bulb comes on. So don't be afraid to have people come in who can come and speak to your team on, uh, you know, certain aspects of maybe an aspect of coaching that they're just not, that's just not clicking for them. Um, What I do as, as, as my profession is I am a discipline and mindset coach. So I come and provide uh, strategies, uh, discipline, mindset, productivity, and wellness strategies for athletes to be able to navigate athletics, academics, and their lives in general so that, they, so that when they transition into what's next, they're much more better equipped as Um, having personal accountability and being aware and just focusing on the things that really matter to them in the season of life that they're in, whether they're youth, whether they're college, whether they're, you know, former athletes. So bringing someone in is definitely something I, um, I offer as a suggestion I've done myself and some things just tend to hit differently when it comes to, uh, your athletes who you're around all the time, um, hearing it from someone else who's coming in new. Anyone else, does anyone else have any questions? If um, you don't wanna write it in the chat and you just want to unmute yourself, go ahead and unmute yourself, raise your hand. So um, in the, using the emojis reaction so everyone's not talking at the same time, but uh, you can definitely unmute yourself. So mom says, thanks, this is very informative. And sometimes it's the coaches with issues as well. The yelling, berating of athletes with overbooking a kid in events, as you stated earlier. I know winning is most coaches goals. However, sometimes we need to celebrate the small victories. Amen, mom. Yes, amen, I firmly agree. How about you, Dr. Creer? Oh, most definitely. I, I, I think that that's what we're, we're saying, because, when you know, the, the reality is that we're losing these children. We're losing not just in sports, but, you know, when someone takes their life and it could be prevented and you, you know, could have done something maybe to help. That's a big pill to swallow. And I think that as coaches and then as athletes, we just re- need to redefine what winning is and what losing is and what success is and what failure is and make it not just by the end result. Um, remember we're coaches and that's you're getting paid for it. You know, where we're supposed to develop these children, not extort these children and then exploit these children, but to develop them. And I think that 
you know, as coaches and as leaders, we need to become more educated on not just mental health. We're not asking you to be counselors or therapists to know the definitions of, um, you know, PTSD or, you know, OBD, OCD or anything of that nature. But we just need you to know that I know this stuff that's not right with my athlete and how can I get this person help? And you have to deal with the parents, which is very challenging. But remember, and I'm an advocate of this, you can't be, you can be the greatest coach, you can be the greatest dentist, you can be the greatest surgeon, but you can't operate on yourself. So it's important that you make sure that you're okay. I know that I'm good, but I have a counselor. I have a therapist. You know, I have someone that I make sure that I'm okay because, you, you know, the sick can't help the sick. So I think that if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact me or, or Sean, but this is an ongoing um, um, ongoing process, just like your athletes progress during the seasons and during the years, they progress emotionally as well. And their emotional security and their emotional intelligence grows as well. We got a couple of questions. So Brian, you can unmute yourself and then Coretta, when he is done, then you may ask your question. Thank you. Yeah, I think you touched on it, Dr. Career. I mean, the main thing is check your ego at the door. There is no ego in coaching. I mean, the number one goal for any coach should be give the kid a great experience, period. <laughs> it's about the kids. It's not about you. It's not about the parents. It's about the kid. End of story. Amen. Absolutely, absolutely. And Coretta, your question, please. Again, thank you. I just want to echo some of the comments of just how effective and awesome this has been so far. I have a question in terms of guidance or advice or suggestions that we may be able to give um, our children or our athletes that we may be coaching when it comes to their involvement in team sports. I mean, I just want to keep going back to track because that is a reference here. So track and field is still a very much a team sport, um, even if you're running your individual race. Same thing with a lot of the other sports. But my question is, as children get older and they're in their late teens or moving into that late adolescent phase, they are observing their own behavior when it comes to maybe mental illness and mental health. And also their, their teammates may be observing behaviors or things that may be out of character for them. And so in terms of not violating any HIPAA, you know, restrictions or any Thing in terms of how much information to give it's not I don't think it's appropriate for the coach to give any information to the other teammates but what suggestions do you have for how does an athlete communicate with their teammates about struggles that they or hurdles they may be going through from a mental health perspective as they're still in that team environment well, that's a good question and I look at it like the the environment and that's where the coach just starts with the coaches it's like that athlete wouldn't have a problem maybe discussing with his co his teammates about an injury, a physical injury. Let's say if he had a strained hamstring, man, my hamstring is tight. And well, other man, I'm, my hamstring is too. So we have to have an environment where mental health and struggles is, you know, okay to, to discuss. And uh, they call it a psychological safety and an emotional safety space. And as a, a team and as a coach, you need to provide that as well, that emotional and psychological safety where, you know, an athletes, I know, you know, my daughter says, oh, my, my calves are tight today. Me too. That was a tough workout. Right. And then they, they don't feel ashamed by, you know, do I have to run that four by four? Yes. But, <laughs> but they talk about that. So I think that just providing an atmosphere where the, to talk about emotional uh, mental um, illness, I don't say that what mental challenges is just as um, open and freely as you speak about the physical challenges from a laborious or challenging workout. So if you, from day one, or even if you just want to implement it now, just say, hey, we're going to talk about the health. Hey, as a coach, is there stress and anxieties? Yes, this is a tough workout. But also, you know, I understand that there's some things that are going on in life. 
and, you know, feel free and maybe, you know, be transparent. Leadership should be transparent. Be transparent in your delivery and say, hey, you know, I've been stressed out. A coach didn't do a good job. You know, I yelled when I shouldn't have. And, you know, that's because that's what stress is. So some of you guys may be seeing that in your race, you know, and, you know, so feel free to talk to me about it. You know, just make it as open as someone would be discussing a physical element, if you will. Yes, I think that's very, very, very important. Being able to humanize yourself as, as who you are authentically, in addition to, you know, just coach. So, you know, your athletes may know you as just coach, you know, coach career, you know, just as coach Coretta and being able to show up authentically as a coach and humanizing yourself and letting them know, hey, I understand gives them the space to also show up authentically. I think that's very important. And if they're able to comfortably show up authentically, they are then opening their minds to being able to receive information easier for them to be able to process that information easier. And then for them to be able to coexist and be a cohesive team, as well as growing themselves as a whole you know, a whole full, well, you know, well running machine as the student athlete um, that they are um, or the professional athlete that they are. Um, Dr. Cholula had his hand raised and then we have two questions in the chat. Perfect, I just kinda wanna share something really quick as a, as a coach and now, and since the topic is coping skills, I just kinda wanna point out about the idea of uh, sharing coping skills in a fun way. They are children <laughs> and uh, most youth. I think we really want to make it a, a, in, a, in a way that is also authentic. What does that mean? So sometimes when we practice like breathing exercises, right, to help reduce some of the anxiety before the meet or before the race. So a lot of the times, you know, we're like, oh, do breathing exercises. That's going to help you. So let's make it a little bit more meaningful. For example, I work with many of the Spanish speaking families and we usually say, smell the hot chocolate and blow the candle. And a lot of kids don't wanna do breathing exercises. Oh, that's embarrassing, <laughs> right? And um, most kids will learn it in a fun way. We can really teach a lot of coping skills, problem solving strategies in a way that is meaningful for the kids. And uh, also, I think with that and same, same process, a lot of the times when uh, coaches, we kind of, we reinforce those positive behaviors by pointing it out. Great job for doing the breathing exercises before your race. You know, that's reinforcing positive behaviors. Mm -hmm. and, and then one last thing, I think uh, the coping strategies can be effective. You can also find your own ways that works for you, but also for others, you know, doing breathe, um, praying before a race. You know, that's actually itself. Praying? Praying, yes. Okay. Yes, praying itself, it's a coping skill. It helps reduce the nervous system, central nervous system. So finding ways that are meaningful to apply these coping skills for the kids, it's great. And as a coach, be creative and have fun with that. Hey, Coach, hey, you know, I know that. I mean, you know, but I love that, you know, but I got to change it up a little bit for the Ebonics, you know what I mean? We smell that chicken and waffles and Roscoe, you know, we, 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 we blow out, you know, I, I got to change it up, you know, the hot chocolate, I don't know. <laughs> I do love all of those coping, those coping mechanisms as well. I think, again, they are young people, you know, give it, give them something that is current, you know, to them, something that is real to them, let it become, let it be, let it become comfortable. I'm sorry, I have been speaking and talking all weekend at this national competition. Um, but yes, making it real for them, making it authentic to them so that, again, that humanization, you know, that allows them to become vulnerable and comfortable and open. Um, thank you for those. Uh, going to the chat, John Neighbor asks, is dependence on handheld devices and social networks making our children more prone to mental health issues? What right does a coach have to limit use of handheld devices? Well, I'm not gonna step into on a coach's toes on this. Okay, how many more questions we have? Just so I love this, I love you guys. You know, I said, okay, we're gonna do this 30 minutes. It's an hour and a half now. 
Praise God. It's Sunday. I just want to, how about tell me, just keep it going. Keep it going. You know, I'll, I'll suspend my hot chocolate, Doc. But no, I think the first one is most definitely social media and having their cell phones on. Yes, that's a lack of focus. Some, some people use that as a coping mechanism, as a distraction, but uh, it depends on what they're listening to and what they're looking at. If they're looking at other performances or looking at other times that people are just right, it might not be a helpful, but if they're, you know, having some, you know, some music or something that they could, you know, use as a positive, you know, coping skill. Yes. Um, what right does a coach have? I think that comes not necessarily in your bylaws, but just in the the, the rules that you imply, you know, and look, uh, you know, limited. Some coaches don't allow any cell phones. Some allow, the, you know, just making sure you're listening to your, 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 your music or whatnot. Some don't allow it at all. At all. So uh, it depends on what way you want to establish your program and you have to stick with it. Some, you know, to nip it all in the bud, you know, some coaches don't allow and to say, Hey, you know, leave your cell phones because, you know, they're up there texting and doing things and not staying focused. And I think the maturity comes in at where some people just use it as music, but I think that that's a, the coaches and the team's, you know, prerogative, but I do believe that if it's not handled in the right way, it can become part of the problem and not part of the solution. Yes, I, I agree. You know, that's a, it's always a touchy subject. You know, those, those handheld devices, you know, yeah. bits of competition, you know, especially for us, you know, the, the rule for, for technology varies, you know, some places you can't have it at all you know, in the warm-up area or definitely cannot have it in the competition area. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a consistency thing. When, when I think about it, it is a consistency thing. You know, are you able to have it when you're in competition? No, okay, well, we're, we're not gonna have it here right now. Or, oh, yeah. you know, when you, if you're warming up and, you know, you're on the field of play, are you supposed to have it while you're warming up? You know, it's that rule, I know just even in my time, being an athlete and then being a coach has varied. At one point, you could use it when you were warming up. At one point, you couldn't because it impairs your, you know, the the area around you from, you know, safety. Hearing, hearing the call time and you're late because you blasted your music. So, <laughs> I you know, had that. You know. <laughs> so in that right, I think, you know, um, what so what right does a coach have to limit? I think it really depends on how consistent you want to be? Do you want to be consistent as it pertains to the rules of the field, or of the of the playing area, of the running area? Um, do you want to allow it in cert at certain points of of practice and and actual competition? I think it's a it's a preferential thing. Um, I think as far as it making our our children more prone to mental health issues it definitely there is definitely uh some some impact and some influence on social media and handheld devices and the uh attention span that students that i say students student athletes that are athletes um have gotten very very short attention spans because social media is meant to be that way social media live I, I i read and heard one time that the average lifespan of a tweet is 11 seconds so think about it you get tweets how many tweets do you when you refresh a, t a twitter feed how many tweets roll through there so there you know when you're scrolling through instagram and facebook and TikTok and all of those things you're constantly looking a 60 second clip scrolling 60 second clip scrolling picture like Everything is so fast paced. And so I do believe that if we take time with our athletes to slow down, have them, you know, really in digest what it is they've just learned or what they're about to learn, we can make a, a very strong impact, a positive impact on their minds when it comes to uh, that type of uh, intake of information, if you will. Um, Sheena Leach just gave an awesome comment and kudos. She said, this is a very informative, even though the focus has was athletics and coaches, it can be used in all aspects of life with parents to children, managers to employees. Excellent Zoom. Thank you so, so much, Sheila. Sheena, we really, really do appreciate that. 
that compliment. Um, Drea said, I love this presentation. I believe this should be mandatory for all coaches. We do too, Drea, we do too. Uh, Brian gives a, a suggestion, a great documentary on social networks and how it affects youth is, it's called The Social Dilemma on Netflix. I, I saw that. Netflix. Did you guys see that? Yeah, that's good. But again, that's a whole open it up in the can. Yes. No um, questions. Are we done? I'm just, I'm not rushing. I'm just rushing. Um, Crystal says, thank you for this great presentation. Thank you for joining us, Crystal. You're most welcome. Um, Brian, um, oh, Brian asked, what conference have I been speaking at this weekend? I actually was announcing at the Adidas Track Nationals in Virginia Beach. So I'm in Virginia Beach this weekend. Uh, last weekend, I announced at the AAU Indoor Nationals. And so the last two weekends, I've been talking quite a bit. Um, <laughs> Diana, says, uh, Diana says, thank you so much. I already shared the flyer with our track coach. Hopefully we can make this happen for our students and coaches as well. Diana, thank you so, so much. We hope to get this information out to as many coaches as possible. What we are going to do with this live stream is uh, we're going to save it, format it, and have it posted so that people who, you know, different time zones, if you weren't, if they weren't able to join, they'll be able to have access to it. And, and hopefully we can continue to give out this, this type of information. Um, I'm going to do a shameless plug if you don't mind. <laughs> Next week, starting March 28th, through April 1st, I cap off, this is going to be the second annual, but I'm capping off uh, Women's History Month with the Women's Discipline and Mindset Summit. Um, it's a summit that I created to uh, highlight women in various industries, sports, uh, nutrition, finance, um, various areas, co you know, it coaches to highlight uh, some very, very uh, important women, influential women, uh, and, and just give them their flowers, but they really all come from at different areas and tell their stories on discipline, on mindset, on wellness, um, and, and, and mental health. And so I will be sharing that information out. You can learn more about it on, um, you can go to my Instagram page, uh, at the LG, I'll put that, uh, handle, in the chat and you can go and follow me it's dlg underscore l is spelled all the way out that's where oh i sent that to just brian let me send that to everyone um but for more information on that you can go to my website of the same address dlg.com and hopefully we can continue that conversation there next week it's a five-day summit starts at 7 p.m every night goes until about 8 30 and then the following week, we will have another episode of From Grind to Gold, where we will have another guest coming and speaking to us on uh, all things grinding and gold in the world of track and field. So definitely stick, keep your eyes open uh, for, on your inbox and you will get all of that information then. And as you saw in the slide, you can contact myself um, and find all my information um, from, from that slide. Follow me on Instagram. Dr. Mark, you're not on Instagram, are you? No, I didn't, no I'm not. He but I just have my website. I'm a fun he work. does have his, he did post his website. You guys can go to the website. Um, <laughs> right Mark.com and find the in, in, in thing. Um, but just in closing, you know, I know it's, we're, we're wrapping up, but I just want to reiterate that, you know, in life, all there's there's positive stress and there's negative stress and, and, and life is full of each. And there's some some things are good anxiety and there's bad anxiety. So I want you to think, if, again, if you're, you're showing symptoms of anxiety or stress, it's, oh, my gosh, it's bad. It's just knowing the toxicity of the negative side and it's getting help. And we're just here to just share a little bit. If you know someone that's in need, if you think err on the side of caution, get your resources, get, um, you know, and li limit the parking lot um, counselors. Parking lot counselors are people that just, you know, don't have no training, but just talk to talk. And it's very important. You don't go to someone on a corner uh, when you have health issues. 
physically. So make sure that you get trained professionals that have uh, have have knowledge and experience. Yes, wisdom comes from you know lifelong lessons. Yes, have that grandmother conversation. But when you're dealing with mental disorders and you know you know serotonin imbalances or medication may be needed, it's it's necessary to seek a professional. And I just want to really say that because. Um, we're losing too many people. So God bless you guys. We're here for you. You have my website. And if you want to just say, you know, say your goodbye so I can go eat. Oh, we got back. Oh, sorry. I went, I got back from Vegas this morning. That's why I went to Las Vegas. You know, this has nothing to do with this, but the wife you want to see this new edition concert. It's just, just, I don't know why she wanted to see new edition. So we was over there, you know, last night we left this morning. So I went straight from the car right to here because we love you guys. So now I'm going to get some eat. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us again, everyone. We're getting all kinds of thank yous and kudos, Dr. Chris. Pull it now. Ooh, so, sorry about that. Thank Dr. Creer. Yes, everyone is thanking you. Um, we thank Dr. Creer. Everyone. Oh yes. <laughs> Diana, uh -oh. go ahead. Oh no, I'm sorry. Oh, we were, I was just jamming out to the new edition too. <laughs> oh, you know about it, huh? But you did, yeah. If it oh, is, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> well, again, have a good night. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. We thank you so much for joining us. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Creer or myself. We are here to give you assistance, guidance in any way we're able to. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you guys. Be healthy.